Okay, so now we're recording. Uh, let everybody introduce themselves. I think everyone's looking at the same screen. And uh, uh, upper, is it upper left hand corner, we have Rod. You want to introduce yourself and. Hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Rod. I'm oh, studying with Dennis, uh, but he's out with COVID. Uh, we usually have class on sa Saturdays, but uh, uh, so we're here. Uh, John John Bucko and I usually study with him. I'm in I'm in near Chicago right now, but uh, that's where we usually are, North Hollywood. Okay, that's Dennis McCafferty, right? Yeah. yeah. Is he is he just uh, what do you call it in isolation, or does he have COVID? He's got it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, who wants to go next? Go for it, Darren. Sure. Hi, I'm Darren Mallorine. Uh, I think uh, a few of you here are familiar regular, so uh, good to see everyone again today on a new year. Um, happy New Year to everyone, and uh, looking forward to today's session. I'm out of New Orleans, Louisiana, so appreciate being here. Thank you. Okay. Next we have, let's try, go to John. John. Do you have any audio, John? Oh, he's mute. Okay, we'll go to, uh, we'll come back to John once he gets, finds, gets his audio going. I thought my audio was on. Oh, no, it is, now it is. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hello, everyone. My name is John Vitale. As, as Rod mentioned, I study with Sensei D, who took over from uh, Renshi Steve. And I did take a class with you, Professor uh, Kirby, very early on in, in my studies at VMAC. Um, but this is my first online seminar, and I'm very happy to be here. Okay. And, uh, okay, to the left of you is, and standing up is, in the middle of the screen, I think, Marco. Is that Bucko? Volume. Mm -hmm. Can you get the volume up? I can't hear fast. Yeah, you can sit. You can sit down and, and, and closer to the screen, Bucko. We we can't hear you. Where the water? He's got his audio off. It can be louder, that'd be great, but otherwise. Are you still muted, bro? That's okay, that's okay. Okay. We will skip Bucko for now and go to... I don't know, I don't know Bucko's <laughs> last name. <laughs> <laughs> Baudry. Bucko Baudry. That's a good cowboy name, Bucko Baudry. <laughs> Where are you? Okay, Dave, you're on next. Introduce yourself. Yes, sir. I'm Dave Clark. We're out of Tampa, Florida. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. It's great to see all the regulars again. Nice to see some new faces, too. And um, looking forward to today's class, especially the, the variety of topics. So happy to be here. Okay. And uh, Thomas is next. Good morning, everybody. Thomas, uh, the T and TJ stands for Thomas. I'm from Southern Illinois, down around Carbondale, and uh, have become quite fond of these meetings, learning a lot. Okay. Gary, you're on. All right. Well, hello. Thank you. George Sensei, finally good to see you. It's been so many years, you know. I discovered your books, I don't know, 40 years ago, and I've been training um, in all sorts. Um, and I always, the only thing I hated about your books was the quality of the photo reproductions were so bad. I wanted to say, we should redo all of these with high quality video. Now we know how to do high quality video. I, I can't find a partner to do it. Arg, 
I would, I, I would be a delight to me. And I think, because otherwise, our, you know, pardon me, this newspaper quality pictures. Yeah. On, on some of the early books, that was the quote quality level, and, and there's there's an interesting story behind uh, redoing those books. But we'll save that for another time. For this kind of, we have better yeah. to deal with. Um, okay, I <clears throat> we're still missing a few people. Uh, uh, there. The uh, first topic, which was going to deal with uh, the, the uh, Stuart Burke, who had had a, a neck fusion surgery, and I guess they pierced his esophagus, and he was in the hospital for that. He wanted questions on how a person with neck fusion, if it, anyone knew anyone who, and how they could participate in the you know, martial arts program. Um, he is now back in the hospital. Uh, and I don't, you know, he's, I've gotten a couple of emails from him, but obviously he's, he's not here. Um, so that's, we're, we're saving his topic. For he can come back because there's no sense discussing, you know, we could discuss it, but you, you, if you have a person who's got firsthand experience and concern, then you're going to get, uh, I think, a better discussion. Uh, okay, topics for today. We've got three left. Uh, one was, and if there's something you'd like to discuss, you know, you can let me know either now or by email, and uh, we will uh, get it online uh, because every everything is fair game here. Um, we were in the last meeting. My notes indicate we were we were talking about. Uh, uh, real street situations and experience with respect to use of force and Randori training. And I think we kind of ended with, we left appropriate, the appropriate use of force. I don't know if we, don't think we covered that. And I more than welcome any input you might, is there anyone here who's an attorney by the way? Okay. Nothing we are saying today is to be considered legal advice. And that should cover all our derriers. Um, because when you get into what's uh, use of force and reasonable force, appropriate force, um, a lot of that gets decided in the courtroom. So we're not going to, you know, we can discuss it till hell freezes over, but. Uh, we're, none of, I don't think any of us are qualified to make a decision as to what it quote unquote actually is. Anyway, um, with that in mind, anyone want to throw out what they believe appropriate force is? If you're in a street situation, okay, and bear in mind, different states have different laws. Um, I think when I was emailing Darren yesterday, I mentioned that I believe in, and I've heard that got this years ago when I was up in Canada um, and I had heard that in Canada, you may preemptively defend yourself against a potential assailant. However, you would have to prove that in court. So you could preemptively attack a person if they thought they were, you know, if, if, if you thought you were going to be physically attacked by them but you'd have to be able to prove that in court. And that's where the, you know, <laughs> that's where the problem arises. Um, there's also the issue of uh, many years ago, uh, what's, what's called, uh, uh, there were a couple of karate gentlemen that I guess were anticipating an assault. And so apparently they, discussed ahead of time what they would do as they were walking down the street, so to speak, and the assault occurred. They ended up going to jail because the court determined that their, their action was premeditated because they had planned ahead of time what they were going to do if they were in a particular situation. And uh, this is something a thing you really need to discuss with your students is, is yeah, you may have something in your head but that doesn't, well, there are two sides here. One, 
that isn't necessarily what's going to happen. And number two, you don't want to tell a person, well, I was planning to do this if he did that. Because then you are running, ask, putting yourself in hot water. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like I, I advise my students in the classroom. If, if, if same thing for a street situation. Um, if like in an auto accident and the police want to get all the information they can right away, but you may say something that it's once you've said something, it's hard to take it back especially to a law enforcement officer or in a court of law. Um, and so what I would always advise my students is simply to say, I'm too upset right now to just talk about this. I've got whatever, you usually have a week or two or more to do the paperwork, so to speak. And so essentially I tell them, wait until you've calmed down, write down what you think you're, is happening until you're happy with it. And then verbally tell the person what happened. Don't show them the piece of paper you've written down on because that can be used as evidence against you. Okay. And I would tell my students this in the classroom. It's a government class, you know, what the heck, you know. Um, and yes, it does not make law enforcement people happy because they can't complete their paperwork. Okay, and they're, they're doing all this paperwork because our legal system requires it. Um, Gary, I sense some concern on your face. You want to speak up? <laughs> so, you know, I've trained with cops. I got cops in the family. Yeah. Cops taught me. They're on the street. I grew up in Detroit. They're Detroit cops. Detroit was sometimes a tough city. And they told me there's nothing you can do to prepare for the situation. Right. And, you know, so Lauren, she's, I don't know, some kind of niece or whatever, sergeant in the Detroit police now, special response unit. And she's walking down the road and she hears these people coming up behind her saying, we're going to get the tall one, you get the short one. She turns around, she says, what do you do? You, you move fast, no, they're gonna chase you. You move to the side. So she pushed her friend away and put her hand here. That's where she carries her sidearm. And she said, back off. And I've been assaulted and I put my nose in the people's face and said, back off, loudly. Um, so it wasn't about documenting, it was about dissuading them and without content, make them run away. That was, you know, and then Chuck, he was one of um, uh, Grandmaster of Premier Prasauza's first year students. And he was a Detroit cop. Now what he could do, I couldn't do. So I wouldn't even mention that, um, but it's, you can't plan for it. And it's, if I'm thinking about documenting it afterwards, I'm thinking way ahead of my feet because there's stuff that comes up, you have no idea. And you've got to have the intuitive response to protect and defend yourself and everyone else. So anyway, just the cops have great intentions, the ones I know, um, but they get put into hard situations and you got to respond in less than a second. That was all. Yeah, it is, it is they, they are, we, we've covered this to some extent before. They, they are, uh, they are in a tough place because they, uh, by law, they are put into this, in the situation where they have to enforce the laws. And so, as I said before, many people, if, if you're unaware that some people perceive them as the aggressor, um, when in fact, all they're doing is essentially doing their job. Of course, I mean, there are, in any profession, there are good, there are good people, there are bad people, but most, most, try, and do, most try and do a good job. 
Um, I, I think you're bringing up the element of what could be called verbal judo. Uh, back off works beautifully. Um, I've done it. Um, sometimes you just you say something that's just unexpected and it stops people in their tracks. Um, and you know it's, it's it it can work sometimes. And uh, anything you can do to avoid a physical confrontation, you do. I mean, that, that's your reality. Um, let's see. We brought on. Lonnie Calhoun is with us now, and John Bowman has joined us, and uh, we're we're kind of getting trying to get into appropriate use of force, um, and that's going to, like I said before, that's going to vary from state to state. So, but it's an issue you need to cover with your students. You know what what. And there, there's no definite line um, between reasonable force and excessive force. It depends on the situation. Uh, one book I would really recommend you get is, uh, I forget the author, it was on the flashlight techniques. The book from the 60s or 70s. Um, and the flashlight techniques are nice, hunky-dory, but in the back section, he has a whole segment on use of force and comparing people by age, weight, height, other factors as to how the reasonable use of force varies. And it's really, you know, you should read it just for your own, name is, uh, John, I can't think of his last name offhand, uh, but the uh, uh, book is entitled Flashlight Technique, something flashlight technique, something like that. Um, but it's a good, it's a good reference and there are court cases in there. And if you ever find yourself in a bind or one of your students, they need to, their attorney needs that. Uh, <laughs> so. It's John Peters. John Peters, you're absolutely, thank you, Gary. And, and he's an author from a long time ago. Um, but it's, it's really worthwhile. And uh, as I also said, in, I think in our last meeting, you know, I've, I've been to court once on use of force. Uh, you may have to, exp if you use a technique on a person or do something, you will probably have to explain what you did. Um, and as Gary said, and I didn't mean Gary that, you know, when, if, if something, if something happens, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to write down what happened because in a street situation, you may not know what you did. You know? Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, it, it's, I've had students that have been in street situations. They don't remember exactly what they did until they were able to step back, calm down, and then they, you know, then they could be pretty accurate. But at the time, there you go, defensive tactics. There you go. Thank you, Darren. Um, they did not, you know, it's, it's like being in an auto accident. You don't know what you did, and you don't want to open your mouth and incriminate yourself or say something that can be used against you. Uh, so that's why that's why I advise students, you know, wait till you can. It, it, it's like a, a police officer after an incident having to write the report. And if you write something down right away and it turns out to be inaccurate, you're now in a defensive position to explain yourself. And even though that's not what you meant to say, it's on paper. So that's why I say they need to write it down rewrite it as necessary until they're totally comfortable with it. And then go and talk to whomever you need to talk to, but don't take that paper with you. <laughs> and I mean, it's sad that you have, it's sad that we have to function that way, but how do you say it's a reality? Um, okay. Um, in California, 
appropriate force is probably what's called reasonable force. And that is whatever you do, whatever you need to do to prevent the attacker from continuing his attack against you and removing yourself from the situation, safely removing yourself. Um, and that's still open to a lot of interpretation. Um, it, it doesn't mean that once your attacker is down, and, you know, most of my students who have been in street situations, their person gets injured either from the technique that was used or when they impact with the ground. I've never had a student who's had to go into groundwork or submissions. Um, and if the person is injured on the ground and you start beating up on him, kicking him, and sucking like that, now you're using excessive force. And that's what gets you in trouble. And that's also what gets law enforcement people in trouble. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's a gray area. You know, what can I say? Um, and Gary probably has lots of stories he'd like to tell, right? <laughs> no, no audio, Gary. When you're, when you're in the situation and your blood gets hot, your blood gets hot. Right. That's, your blood's hot. That's all I can say. Yeah. Um, I had, when I taught at the junior high, I had, we, we had a, a, a teacher, and I was a union rep too. We had a teacher who really should not have gotten a, his tenure. He had no business being in the classroom. And, uh, he apparently, uh, how do you say it? A couple of my kids were talking about him behind some lockers and he went up and, I mean, I watched the whole thing. He pushed one of them up against the lockers and my kid who happened to be a brown belt came back with both his hands up, palms out, said, you know, I don't want to do it. And anyway, the teacher grabs him, says, starts hauling him off the office. And, uh, uh, he saw me and he said, Mr. Kirby, come with me. I want you as a witness, which was a bad move on his part. Uh, <laughs> but the funny thing was, is as, as this kid was, as this teacher is you know, grabbing my student by the arm, taking him off the office, the kid looks at me questioningly and starts going like this, just taking his arm and kind of, because I knew what technique he was going to go into. It would be an elbow lip elbow forward elbow lift and i just shook my head i said no he, you know he didn't do anything uh, my, my anyway so the the kid ended up not going having being sent home for anything because the teacher is the one that initiated the uh, attack for lack of a better phrase uh but anyway um things you know you do you know there's a fine line between just doing things that you have to, and this kid at least realized he was in a situation where he had an option to do something or not to do something. And uh, I complimented the kid later for using good judgment <laughs> because uh, I don't know what would have happened after that. Anyhow, um, anybody else want to do anything with, with appropriate use of force or... And say, um, I'll, I'll share a little something here. Florida has a very controversial stand your ground law. And um, you mentioned uh, California's uh, reasonable force. Uh, what is reasonable force versus what is excessive force? And this stand your ground law went uh, into effect a number of years ago. And we've seen uh, several uh, cases a year in the paper with people. Um, um, basically refusing to back down in a public space where they have a right to be. And um, it, it, it's a, it's a yin-yang, you know, it, it's, it's really great. Even with the law having these four, these four established parts, um, the law establishes that law-abiding residents and visitors may legally presume the threat of bodily harm or death from anyone who breaks into a residence or occupied vehicle and may use it defensive force, including deadly force against the intruder. Well, that's the castle law. But it goes on and says, in any other place where a person has a right to be, that person has no duty to retreat. And that's where it really gets gray. 
because if attacked, you may meet force with force, including deadly force, if he or she reasonably believes it is necessary to do so to prevent death or great bodily harm to himself or herself or another, or to prevent the commission of a forcible felony. This actually, like, can you use deadly force to commit to prevent the commission of a felony? It's, 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 it's and we've had some fascinating cases that I've followed that go on for years in the courts. Um, those are the, those are two of the four um, premises. Bottom line is um, um, the other one, uh, the other two, in either case, a person using force uh, permitted by the law is immune from criminal prosecution. And the last one is if a civil action is brought and the court finds the defendant to be immune, based on the parameters of the law, the defendant will be awarded all costs of defense. So that's Florida stand your ground law. And it's about as, well, some people call it forward thinking, but some people think it's very backward thinking. <laughs> well, almost, almost goes back to medieval times. You know, when you're trying to get from one castle to another without getting robbed or mugged. <laughs> it, you know, a, a person does have a right to defend himself and a person does have a right to protect himself from injury. Um, but good judgment also has to come into play. Uh, as, Absolutely. And if, if, unless, <clears throat> how do you say it? Uh, uh, unless you have to actually protect another person or uh, retreating or retreating would be, it would increase your chances of becoming a victim. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, as they say in the Marines, advancing to the rear um, because it does show good judgment. And if, you know, if you, it's, it's how do you say, and, and you, you can look at, how do you want to say, uh, you can look at Sun Tzu, you can look at a lot of military people that uh, have set up battle plans or been in, you know, decided what happens where, um, they understand the importance of having your, your forces retreat or move out of the way at certain points, uh, simply because if, if there's nothing really to be lost, why put your people at risk? Uh, and, uh, but you know, it's it's. I, I think I think the stand your I think it's called stand your ground law. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, it's nice, but I think at times it gets it gets abused. Yeah, that's, that's, that's part of the controversy. Yeah, yeah I, I have a question. Yes. Give me a chance. Uh, as as instructors, I mean, this is this is. I mean, on the the individual responsibility is one thing. Um, but as someone who, who was, um, who leads a dojo, who uses the insurance <laughs> policy <laughs> that, uh, that we all are under, uh, what type of protection do we have? That's, that's one question. Um, and I think that I'm in Virginia, so we don't have a, a standard ground. We've got that reasonable, uh, use of force. Uh, thing and I've also been deputized, so I do have a, a bit of knowledge from the other side um, in terms of what it is. But uh, but in, but t but instructing our students, I always start off with the you know the code, the state code as a definition, and also I also say, do you have a lawyer? <laughs> Amen. Do you and do you have a lawyer? Because it's one thing that's on paper, but then try to articulate your position. You're not we're not qualified to articulate a position. Um, unless you're a lawyer, um, and they're not absolutely right either. Right, I agree. Right. I agree. What we have, and, and Lonnie brings up a really important point: if you should all, if you're instructing, you should have a release. No if, ands, or buts. It also needs to be checked by a lawyer who is qualified in your state to deal with those types. Of legal documents, um, and and relief the legal standards. What happened can vary from state to state, 
And that's why you need to have an attorney check over your release to make sure it'll fly in your state. Um, <clears throat> I have a, we have a release. And then after your, the attorney approves it, <clears throat> um, it, for example, when we, we've made a couple of changes in, in our participant release over the years, we also then send it to the insurance company and say, is this okay? Will you cover our butts still? You know? And uh, so it's, yes, an attorney is going to cost you a few hundred bucks, but that's a lot cheaper than dealing with a lawsuit. The other thing we have that, that Lonnie brought up <coughs> is um, our release contains, I guess it's called a third party disclaimer where um, the, I'm trying to phrase it. If I sent you a copy of the release, you'd be easy to see. If, <clears throat> if, if a student uses a technique on another person, that person will not come back to us and sue us for the action of the student. The student assumes full responsibility. This is a matter of covering your own butt, not the students. And uh, we, we've lost a couple of potential students over the years because of that, that statement in our participant release. And I think it's, I think it's called a third party disclaimer um, because you do not want to be responsible for anything your student does out on the street. And they shouldn't be able to, because what will happen is that the person that they theoretically injured will sue them. And then the student may turn around and sue you for teaching them this technique that resulted in their injury. It's, it's a sad word, but <laughs> um, so anyway, if, if, if you want, if you want a copy of the release, send me an email. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just send it to you because I have them. Um, the other thing that should be on your release is a medic, your participant release is a uh, medical release for kids under 18. Um, if you have been a parent and your kid has gone off to camp and stuff like that, or gone some, you know, most places have you sign a medical release. Okay. Um, and ba because it's, again, it varies from state to state. In California, if a person under 18 is injured, the medical doctors cannot do anything except keep the person alive. They cannot do any type of other type of medical treatment until they have parental permission or court permission. Um, and that's why you have a medical release, okay? How often have I used it in 53 years? Once. Uh, and that was when, a, during lunch in my class in the junior high, two of my jiu-jitsu kids were working on the mat. It was a girlfriend, boyfriend, and she put him in a headlock pin on the ground and he decided he was gonna get out of it. Bad mm -hmm. move. Uh, <laughs> they were still friends after them. Um, Ultimate, ultimately, ultimately, all we had was a sprained neck muscle. But, it, you know, we had to call paramedics, the backboard to the hospital. The principal let me go to the hospital even though I was supposed to teach. Uh, the parents showed up around four in the afternoon. I don't know where they had been. Uh, and uh, the kid was basically okay. But they were so thankful that I had, that they had filled out that medical release. Because that Met, the doctors were able to do something. Um, and that's why you do it. Uh, you, you, you know, if, if you're working with kids, you need to have, you really should have medical, because if you didn't, then you, they, the parent could come back and say you were negligent. Again, it's a matter of, how do you say, CYA? Yeah. So. Professor? Yes. Uh, on that, two things. Um, the, it, it, any time that I have had a specialty insurance for dojo situations, that is a carrier that is specializing in martial arts, they have always been able to also provide 
a very expansive waiver that met their criteria because they're the ones that would have to adjudicate any claims that came on the insurance side. And so I do recommend if, if any dojo is uh, in need of insurance, if you're not covered by some other umbrella, it's, it's the same thing I use in my ministry practice for counseling. It's essentially a specialty for malpractice counseling or for mm -hmm. insurance. And they will help you develop this waiver that reflects everything your state specifically requires. Right. Uh, and it's turnkey. It's well worth, um, in my experience, paying for those policies for that reason. Um, okay. And if I might come back to the use of force from the discussion of instructor level activities uh, in having the opportunity to uh, have as students law enforcement officers but also key investigators um, one thing that we developed in the academy that i teach in is what what is a technique being perpetrated against you that is potentially going to cause great harm and this is what the law enforcement officer said you are justified to respond appropriately and and this was the this is the phrase we tried to instill in our students if a worst case scenario develops and you are dealing with a report being made the most important thing to say is i was afraid for my life and leave it at that and as long as it wasn't a handshake and then you did a throat punch which would obviously be inappropriate it was kind of that would cover basically no matter where you were and so then we would train and we still do if someone is trying to hit you in the head a force appropriate response is x if it's something less severe like they're grabbing your wrist a force appropriate response is x and it helps the students whether they use the language of force continuum or not recognize some things are good some things are bad and i have to be in that moment uh, rather than just let's see what happens anticipate it so just a couple of offerings there yeah the, yeah number one fear for my life is an incredibly important statement to make and, and as you said uh, particularly for civilians you want to leave it at that because sometimes if you say more I, sometimes the more you say the more you leave yourself open to a challenge um, and again, with the use of force continue, you know, you, you kind of, in, in some way, teaching a martial arts class is somewhat similar to law enforcement because you are giving your students these, these unusual skill sets, but you also have to instill in them the use of proper judgment. Um, you know, when do you back off? Um, you know, and, and you can't nail a situation down because the street, the street is going to never be the same as the mat. Um, but you have to instill, they need to know what techniques can do. Um, they need to know, how do you say, they need to know when to back off. <laughs> Because uh, the same goes for law enforcement personnel, you know, and, and that's a rough, that's a rough road to to walk on, uh, because you don't always know what's going to happen. Um, Sensei, on that topic, uh, we also teach um, to be the first to call law enforcement. Yes. The way, we, the way we playfully put it is the second liar doesn't have a chance. But what, what, what we say is be proactive. If you're the one who called law enforcement, you're the one who, um, uh, when the officer arrives, will say, who called me? Right. Well, if, if they don't, you still want to be proactive. You want your side first um, yeah. in, in, in the confrontation. Um, using however, you know, as few words as possible, um, but uh, the... It, it, it becomes a fact that you're the one who called law enforcement, not the other person. Therefore, I, I am acting like um, uh, I, I, I feel like the law is on my side. 
I could be wrong, but I still am acting like I feel like the law is on my side, which means I feel like I, I am acting in a righteous way. Right. And that's, 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 that's another important thing to stress these students. And once, usually the person, how do you say it? I'm trying to rephrase it. If you call the police, they're more, if you're the first person to call the police, they're more likely to believe you than the person who you defended yourself against. Gary's chuckling here. I'm laughing because we were just through this uh, a month or two ago. Wow. So, so two quick ones. First is how we teach children to respond with appropriate force is different than how we teach adults. Okay. So in our dojo, we teach children. They're, you know, they're 12 years old, 15, who knows? And that's a different teaching to protect themselves than adults who may be needing to protect somebody else at the same time. Okay. So there's a differentiation there. That's a subtlety. And, and yes, so let's just say, let's just say for speculation purposes, a bunch of teenage yahoos are fighting out in their yard and arguing about dividing up a brick of something. And my son says, I want to call the sheriff. And my wife says, you don't call the sheriff against your neighbors. You go out and settle it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so he put on the tactical vest and he took a sidearm of some sort, which he never raised from the ground. So that's the trick. If you don't raise it from the ground, that's very different from raising it. Now, he didn't take out a baton. I would have taken out a baton. You know, the Arnie's batons I use, all that. And he just said whatever he said to them, and they ran away to Mama. And then she called the sheriff against us. So, you know, yeah, it gets all sorts of tricky. Yeah. Yes, I do understand. Yeah, it, it, if, 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 if there's a confrontation and you come out and whatever you're wearing or holding in and of itself is seen as an escalation and the person retreats and then they call the police, now you have to defend what you did over what it just gets more complicated exactly although it all settled out she said the the sheriff's deputy said yes you all agree on what happened everything was fine and we all agreed that next time the telephone is your best Amen. absolutely yeah don't say weapons <laughs> just resource <laughs> <laughs> yeah it it is, it is a, a tight situation, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, and 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 you're just bring one other element. I know we're going to some sort of segue here. Uh, your voice in, in a street situation is so important. Um, if if you and, and this is something they really try and get law enforcement people to do is if you can talk in a calm but authoritative voice and it doesn't have to be loud people will listen to you and follow your direction because they know that that uh, for lack of a better phrase the stuff can hit the fan if they don't comply and that's the key. Uh, years ago, I had a highway patrolman who came and talked to my kids for something and in school. And he said, he said, the hardest thing for me to do when I first went out on patrol was when I approached a car to give them a traffic ticket was if I, I was really scared because this is my first time, so to speak. And he said, it was so hard 
not to say, please, may I see your driver's license? Because they would have just driven off. <laughs> and he said, he collected himself, used a low, calm, authoritative voice, and there was no problem. He ended up giving the person just a warning. But the point is how you, your physical appearance goes a long way to determine how people will interact with you. Um, as, I, as I told my kids in school, if you look like you know what you're doing, and if you look like you know where you're going, very few people will get in your way because there's just a presence there. And my kids were, some of my kids who were gangbangers, they, they would actually say, yeah, they come back, you know, the next week, yeah, it worked. I was in the store and no one bugged me. Um, again, and it had to do with, you know, they say they were wearing regular clothes. Uh, <laughs> but um, your, you know, your voice, your presence, your attitude goes a long way to determining how another person will respond to you. And uh, another, another thing, a side thing for when you're, and I learned this, I learned two things I learned are because when I was taught junior high, I could work in the counseling office uh, if a counselor was absent. And I learned two really important things. Uh, one, never ask a person why they did something. You ask them, what were your reasons? And you sometimes actually get useful information from that. Whereas, why did you do that? Puts them in a defensive mode because then the person automatically thinks you think they're guilty. But somehow saying, what were your reasons? Gives them an opportunity to explain themselves. The other thing was, if you have to have a discussion with another person, if you can, both of you should be sitting down because it puts you at about the same eye level. And that way, no one person, it, it removes kind of like what's called the intimidation factor. I'm looking down at you. Okay. And, and you can have a much better conversation. In the street, however, if you have a person pinned uh, and, and they're under you and you're looking down at them, that's a different situation. But uh, uh, anyway, <clears throat> let's get back to, I think we're- Real, real quickly, I don't mean to interrupt, but you I, talked about the verbal pen and the physical pen. Can we use both those tools? Yeah. Yep. I mean, I, 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 when I was in high school, we had a principal, he was a big black guy. Kids loved him. But if he told, he had a low voice. He never had to repeat it. I never saw him raise his voice to anyone. Even in, in, if there were, you know, kids fighting, he'd simply walk up and say, stop. And they stopped. <laughs> He just had, you know, he had this presence about him and, and he, he just came across as being totally calm in control. And uh, it, it's, it's so, you know, how do you say your verbal presence or your physical presence it is so important in being successful and it, whatever you do in that, I think in any aspect of life. Um, and, and, you know, you can be concerned and you can be want to be helpful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can change your tone of voice and pres you know, presence accordingly. But it's, it's something that's important for, for your success in whatever you do. Okay. Um, the second topic, and I don't even think we're going to get to the third one. Uh, it says, would love to talk about possibly see demonstrations with a technique issues related to the difference between conditioned response that is more autonomic and response that reflects the cultivated instincts and motions. Is there someone here who made that request? That's from me. That's from you. Okay. By, okay. by, 
autonomic, what do you, what do you, I, I looked up the word autonomic because I wanted to make sure where I was on it. Um, what did you mean by autonomic? I'm uh, th thinking of it in terms of uh, Tim Larkin's target focus training talks about, for example, you hit someone in the stomach and they're going to bend over and that's an autonomic response. It gives you the next target and the next target. And likewise, if someone comes at you, you're generally going to have an autonomic response. If you come at me with the punch, I'm probably going to do something like this. So that type of autonomic I'm drawing this from your book on uh, toward one technique. There's a section where you talk about the difference between these biologically conditioned responses and motion, which can flow out of repetitive practice. Okay. Okay. So you're looking for, for the difference. I think um, The conditioned responses are, or see, a conditioned response can be a trained response. If it's autonomic, it's, it's a, I don't know what the correct term is, internal response. It's a natural response. It's a, because uh, I looked at it, it's, it's a fight or flight response, mm -hmm. for lack of a better phrase. Person's going to hit, you know, cut, hit you, you put your hands up, you know, it's that's natural. You get hit in the stomach, you bend over. Okay. Uh, if someone threatens you, and this also has to do with your adrenaline level, because the autonomic response will trigger a increased flow of adrenaline from your adrenal glands. It's just part of your body protecting itself automatically. Okay. Um, and that could be when you're in either physically attacked or it can be a fearful situation or you're in a situation that you haven't experienced before and you're quote unquote afraid or apprehensive. Um, and that's a natural response of your body. Okay. Are, are, are we still on the same page? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. I just wanted to make sure that's where we were because autonomic responses can go in a whole there. Autonomic responses break into two different kinds, and, and, there, and there are subcategories of rada rada yada. And right. I just wanted to know for sure where you were at. Um, Mushin is it's a train. Mushin is a trained response. Okay, and. Um, but it's based on, how do you explain it? It's based on, it's based on practice. It's based on training. So that ideally it's the same thing with use, you know, uh, use of force. Theoretically you train officers. So if A happens, they do B. If C happens, they do D. Okay. It's, if you train enough in that odds are, that's what's going to happen in a real situation. Um, Mushin goes further in that it's all done, there's no thinking involved. It's all automatic because you've trained your brain to store, well, if A happens, I can do B or I can do C or I can do D, depending upon, and then your brain, it's a subconscious or it's not an unconscious decision, it's a subconscious decision that occurs faster than you can actively think about it. Okay, so that's the difference between autonomous and a automatic response. Now, an, auto an automatic response can be a autonomous, autonomic. It can be autonomic um, as well. But your the the idea of motion is. I mean, you, motion we do every time, you know. Any, any time you do anything, I mean, if if you decide to go to the store, you do a lot of things without, in the process of getting to the store, without even thinking. And all of that is is motion because you've done it enough times where it's just 
It's an automatic response. It's an automatic thing that you do. If you're going to have a cup of coffee, you don't say, I have to extend my hand around the handle on the cup, lift the cup, bring it over to my mouth, get it to my mouth, tilt it up. <laughs> you don't think of all these steps. <laughs> but all of that is motion. It's just automatic. You know, you've, you've done it enough that it's automatic. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, so that's in my book, that's really the, the difference. You know, it's, 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 you, you don't want to say that motion is pre planned because it isn't. It's just you've got all these, there are lots of different ways you could grab a cup of coffee. Okay. And your mind isn't going to sit there and say, which one will I use? Okay. It's just, you're just going to do it. And that's, to an extent, that's motion. Okay. When you get into a self-defense situation, okay, motion is where you, you may start with one thing, but whatever you want to do may go south and you have to do something else. And if you've trained yourself enough in those situations, which is, which also needs to be part of the student's training in, uh, in terms of you need to give your students, your students need to learn counters to techniques because you have to teach them not only counters to techniques, but counters to those counters or what do you do when? Because simple as something simple as a hand throw, well, no, I won't say a hand throw, because hand throw is pretty solid, wrist lock takedown side wrist lock takedown. Um, there are a lot of counters to that little puppy. And you need to know what to do for each of those counters. And at the time you can't think about it though, it just has to happen or otherwise you're in trouble. So that, that's why you have to train your students with all these counters so that it becomes lodged in their brain so that when I had a parent whose, whose husband was, uh, he used to be a Catholic priest, but then he became a counselor. Um, and it was the most successful parent conference I ever had in my teaching career once with him. But, um, cause he wasn't into punishment or anything. He was into, you know, let's get, let's get this down. What can we do to resolve it, et cetera, et cetera. But his wife was fantastic because her attitude was shit happens. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, on a, in a street situation, you're doing something, shit happens. Uh, and you just have you just have to deal with you have to deal with what you get. And, and that's where that's where the motion comes into play, where your body just automatically moves from one thing to another to another as the situation evolves. Um, anyway, you were gonna I got a really quick one. Yes. Just when you're in a really high stress situation, your field of view narrows from here to here. here. Yes. You get tunnel vision. And then you only see what's there. Yeah. And you don't see everything. This is the stress response. Our biology, we have that. But so we train blindfolded and we can only feel what's going on and then we can deal with it. Just, it's a game, it's fun, but it's real. Okay, two, two things and then we'll go to Thomas. Uh, and this is again for your students. They need to develop their peripheral vision because most attacks will come from the periphery. Okay. And what I tell my students is don't, you don't want to have this narrow tunnel vision. This is my attacker. This is what I'm focusing on. Because what you see, what you see is not important. All you're seeing is his face. What you need to, what you need to, what you need to sense 
is what is going on, and that is done largely by feel. Because at some point you're going to be in, in, you know, once if you have this close vision, you're probably already in physical contact with this person. And if you know your techniques, you should be able to determine by feel what's working, what isn't. The the second thing you brought up, ah, and I forgot what it was now. Um, peripheral vision was one that's so very important. Uh, just feel the response. You're feeling each other's response, oh, and you can blindfolded. be blindfolded and still right. do it. Blindfolded. You need, and I, I will do this with my black belts and sometimes with brown belts, okay? And we do it kind of as a game, but then they really get into it. Um, and I usually have one person in the center, blindfolded, and then two or three people standing around, and they'll reach for this person. And the blindfolded person, you know, tries to find whatever it is and grab onto it. And it, it doesn't work right away, but eventually some of it, a few of them get really good at sensing where an extremity, and by, I don't know whether it's by body heat or what, but training blindfolded is so important, particularly um, for control hole submission, anytime where there's body contact, because you have to do things by feel. Because visually, you can be, you can really be distracted, um, and that's hard to do. But if you can, you know, again, that's another thing where you can train your students with is, is make them have them start on the ground, have them set up a submission and try and maintain it just by blindfold. The the, the one rule we have is don't do anything fast because that's where injuries are going to happen because you're blindfolded and you're relying more on physical touch and sensation, you may do things that may inadvertently injure your opponent or yourself. But it is, as Gary said, it's, it, it, is, it is good training. Okay. Um, go slow. Pardon? Oh, go slow. Cook it well, but go slow. Yes, do it slow. Uh, Thomas, you're going to say something. I didn't necessarily have a I didn't necessarily have a follow on to that. I, uh, if you could talk about in teaching, do you do you see an example where one particular technique stands out as as a jujitsu when when motion is cultivated? This type of technique, is it a throw, is generally what will come forth most naturally versus that untrained but conditioned response of fight or flight. Okay. Um, offhand, I would probably go to two techniques. One would be... Uh, An Asadagari being countered, and then you just go into, I would call it Ukiyotoshi or floating drop throw. Uh, if you're trying to get the person to go backwards, but he stiffens up and wants to go forward, you just fall back, hold on to him, fall back to your left, and turn to your left. Uh, that's a conditioned response. Um, I mean, there are other one, there are other things you can do from An Asodagari that fails, <laughs> uh, but for me that's that's the easiest one because what you're doing there is you have you're sensing you're you're sensing their key or where they want to go, and now rather than fighting them, you're helping them. Um, another one would be wrist lock takedown, which has lots of options for counters. And uh, does, does anybody have, no one has an UK today? No one's got an UK. Okay. Uh, wrist lock takedown is where someone, had, my hand has just peered through the rock. Uh, such strength. Uh, 
<laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, easy counter for a wrist lock takedown is simply to sidestep into the person, bend your elbow. Okay. What does the Tory do? You can either, uh, the, the simplest one I give my students is they bend their elbow. You either push in and step back and it's either push, pull, push or pull, push, pull. Okay, and, and I said, I don't care what which one you do because either one of those will straighten out their arm and allow you to do the wrist lock takedown. Other alternative is you've got that wrist lock, their elbow is available, you do a forward elbow roll. Okay, they can counter by trying to roll over. Okay, in which case you just go into a wrist press or you can, or you can go down uh, as you take them down, you can bring your left knee up on their upper arm and push straight down, which will prevent them from rolling over. Um, all of these are ultimately conditioned responses, but they all show motion because you've trained the person to, if A happens, B, then I do B, okay? And you need to train, the students need to be trained in this, <clears throat> which is when Darren, over the couple, one or two sessions ago, when you went from one technique to another to another and you had the counter and counter counter you have to you know this may not be able to do this except with your brown and black belts but they need to they need to do this because they need it it's a tool i mean it's it's a tool that's just as important as learning the basic wrist lock takedown um the autonomic responses i think are more protective to be protective of your body. Uh, and it really has nothing to do what you do after you've protected your body. Yeah, you bring your both the hands up to block a hit. Okay, what do you do next? You don't wanna keep them there because they're useless. Um, you know, it's, it's what do you do next? And that's where the motion comes in. If I might, uh, what prompted this is I was thinking as I was reading through your book about the ways that I've watched students progress over the years. And invariably, an advanced student in my academy will come to the place where, and it may be in a moment of randori or it just it kind of ekes out a little bit over a few classes where they stop doing autonomic responses almost all together and everything becomes very intentional it it's effortless they've internalized it but autonomic response falls away like training wheels and now they really do enter in and can control the situation right right and and that the the thing that i appreciated about your book uh, so so apropos is you're talking about you will never get there without repetitive practice you have to drill and drill and scenario and scenario to get to that moment when it happens so i mean what, what i say and i use a phrase endless times i think it's even in, in that last book uh for those of you that are star trekkies uh in the in the board uh resistance is futile mm -hmm. once once you or your student get to that point where they see an attack, they sense the attack and they respond. It's because they're secure enough in their skill level to where they realize they can do something about it. Because in a street situation, controlling your autonomic response is absolutely essential to your survival. Yeah. Okay, you, you have to you have to control that adrenaline level. Okay, it's, I mean, if you lose, I mean, I, if you lose control of your adrenaline level, you lose control of what you can do effectively. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I've seen fights where a kid gets so high on his adrenaline level, crazy people win fights. <laughs> And I've seen it happen, you know. You get some little kid that's being beat up on, 
and that adrenaline comes into play and he goes full bore, the bigger person that is attacking him just can't handle the onslaught. So it's, it's a matter of controlling that adrenaline, controlling your autonomic responses. And when you get to that level, and when they get to that level where they realize, you know, I can just bang respond, the autonomic response really doesn't have a chance to come into uh, as serious a play as it would otherwise. It's going to be there, but it's controlled. And that that is, and once you can control your autonomic response, then your 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 motion, your brain can really do its thing because it doesn't have to deal with the adrenaline that's trying to mess with it. Yeah, I mean, that's, sometimes it's just a pleasure watching students. And, and you know, we have, that's why, you know, we have uh, 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 part of our, our belt testing, particularly brown and black belt, is just to put them in a, where they're getting street attacks for a minute, minute and a half with one or two attackers were attacking randomly together separately with weapons without weapons and the tory has no idea what's going to be coming at him next and they realize they may realize after they said yeah my technique sucked they, they didn't have the quality that i would have in quote unquote kata demonstrating the kata but they worked and, and that's that's an important lesson for them too because nothing's going to work as nice on the street as it does in class um, Thomas, I would add one other thing to uh, the, the demand for high reps, and that is uh, the also demand for high focus uh, during those reps. Um, we, we um, you know, if if um, if re repetitions is the mother of effectiveness, then focus is the father. <laughs> well said. <laughs> it's really, I love that. It's really, it's really important because. You know, we've seen we've seen our students in class where they sometimes toward the end of class they they, they want to get a little careless or you know they're more likely to go into um, horseplay and man you got to call them down and stop it um, and uh, otherwise uh, yeah so anyways yeah I'm quoting you on that Dave I'm writing that down right now <laughs> watch out <laughs> watch out. I, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> uh, it's on video. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's it's. Uh, 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 I mean, and at some points it'll get to where your upper belts are going to horse around with techniques. Uh, I, I actually think that has some value as long as they are working in concert with each other. Uh, years ago, I was at a uh, tournament. It was uh, Kimi no Kata, which is prearranged forms. And there were two black belts, uh, Mike Lynch and Tim Lynch. Um, and I think Mike, Mike has since passed away, but Tim is still running around. And every other team that came out was very serious about doing the forms perfectly. And they basically set up a, uh, 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 what do you call them? Uh, three stooges routine with two of the stooges and they would do what appeared to be the stupidest counters to really legitimate techniques you know and they would have the audience in stitches but their form and techniques were all there um, and, and you really it, it comes down to sometimes you can't play how do you say you can't play with what you know until you know it. And I think all of us have been in situations, you know, where we not recognize, you know, I'm having fun with this, I'm playing with it, but the only reason I'm able to play with it is because I know it. And when that happens to your students, you know, you've scored as an instructor. Because you've gotten them to that point, they can they know their they know their stuff, and uh, then you've succeeded. Um, and hopefully, they'll never have to use it on the street. 
So, um, does that take one other thing? Uh, there were seven of us in the consortium that worked together as we were coming up through the ranks. And um, we would do Randori regularly toward the end of uh, our, our uh, two, two and a half hour sessions. Th there was one time I, I, I was not, I was not as focused as I should have been. And I was playing with techniques. And I, um, I, I injured my, my, my knee severely enough that I needed crutches for a couple of weeks. And it was purely my own ignorance and lack of focus that caused that injury. And um, I, I look back on it in the moment as I walked around on my hands and knees in the dojo and said, I don't think it's bad. It was bad. <laughs> and, and I looked, I reflected on it for days and weeks afterwards saying, I learned something here. Let me write it down. <laughs> okay. One of my... One of my commanders in the military was fond of saying, pain is a good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, the last item we have is uh, also, is there a preferred technique or set of techniques that are more likely to quickly harness the opponent's key as centering of XYZ axes and others? That was a hard question for me. Was that also for you, TJ? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and and I, actually, I actually didn't come up with what I think is a response until this morning. I think mm. TJ gave this to me like a week or two ago. <laughs> I do ponder some of these things because, you know. You know I appreciate it. I do. <laughs> I like to sound competent. Um, <laughs> okay. Here's how I handled it. Okay. Okay. Um, for using an opponent's key or making the X, Y, Z axes work more effectively, you have to become the center of the technique. Okay. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is in whatever you do, you have to look at the issue of uh, if it's an attack, it, then we're, no, we're not talking about, body, well, you can even include body grabs. Deflection of the direction of their energy versus uh, blocking, okay? De deflection redirects their direction or their where their energy is going. Blocking stops it, okay? Okay. Um, one of the things that Mark Tucker, who co-instructed me, is, is always said, he says, he, he says, your head is a very small target. It's, it's a lot smaller than most of us think. And if a person's hitting at you, you only need to block, you only need to deflect their hit two or three inches either way, and it will miss your head. Okay? You don't need to block it really hard he said and and if if you can just deflect it you will then can continue to use their energy to do whatever technique you're doing so i would probably to answer your question is and i'm not it doesn't give you any particular techniques to do but the criteria are you need to become the center and two you need to be able to redirect their energy and redirecting their energy is easier to do with a deflection than a block. Now, okay, there's a, uh, what do you call it? An exception or a, I don't know what the proper term is. There's an escape clause here, <laughs> okay? With a block, okay? Uh, students will tend, when they block, they tend to wait once they block to see what happens. This is more with newer students than older, than more experienced students. When they do a technique, they stop to see what's happening. And that, that kills any momentum or whatever. And, and the execution of any technique becomes, you know, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, rather than mm. do it, okay? Once you block, if you don't believe your blocking is good, 
you're in deep trouble. So you have to assume that your block works. This is if you're blocking an attack or deflecting. Your next move is to trap that extremity so that you can use its energy or direction. Okay, so once you block, you have to quickly before, here's what gets you have to quickly, and this means you've got You've got to do this within three to seven tenths of a second. Get, you have to block and immediately trap and move into whatever technique you're doing before their mind has time to realize they've blocked and now they're grabbing my wrist. Okay. It's, it's I forget what the term is. It's a, and I've said it oftentimes in my books. It, it's the... Uh, your reaction time, the person's reaction time. Once they're blocked, it's going to take their brain three to seven, seven tenths of a second to realize they're, they've been blocked. That's your, that's your window to slide your hand down, hook their wrist or whatever you're going to do and do your technique. If it takes you longer than that to set up whatever you're going to do, it isn't going to work. Because now, oh, I've been blocked. I have to do something else. And they're going to retreat. They're going to retract their arm or whatever. And then if that's where the motion comes into play, if they retract their arm, now what do I do? Hmm. Okay. So that's. Is that going to work as an answer? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And and if I just might put a plug in for your book, uh, I'm sure everyone has it. If not, you should get it. The toward one technique. You do a nice. I think it's you and Sensei Tucker. There's some pictures of. Here's the difference between stopping and flowing with or, or deflecting the technique, and it. That's what precipitated the question. I was realizing that sometimes it was much easier to get in the center of that technique than in other instances. Yes. Uh, and the pictures, by the way, Gary, are much better in that book. <laughs> no, Gary, if, if you, if you, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I have that book. They're much better now, but I would really love, I would love to get partners to reproduce those old pictures in high quality. Okay. The here, here, uh, let me first deal with, with Thomas and then we're going to have to get going here. Um, the uh, I forgot we just oh the title of the book towards one technique. Do you know what it means? Well, I'm starting to gather that it's the one technique that works when you need it because it's the one you can do. Yes, that's all the, towards one technique. That's all it means. It's on the yeah. street. You're going to use one technique. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you're there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep it, yeah. It follows the KISS theory. Uh, Keep it simple, Sensei. Of course, I always heard the last S a little differently, but. <laughs> too, yeah. I've, heard, I've heard two or three variations of that. Okay, yeah. Gary, to deal with your concern about the pictures, what happened at Black Belt is when they switched over to digital, Someone in their infinite wisdom. Now, prior to that time, all the books were made from, you know, you shoot pictures on a camera, you have a negative, you save the negative, the negative is used to make, make the print, you have the picture, the book. Okay. Okay. What happened was that um, when they went digital, Someone in their infinite wisdom threw out all the negatives for all the books. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> so. Not true. You didn't say that, did you? No. Oh. <laughs> Arg. Okay. So when they came out with my first book the second time, the reprinted version, they had a tough time reproducing the prints from the first book because if you look very closely at get a magnifying glass or something 
You yeah. can, all these little dots, black and white prints are really just a bunch of little dots. And it was hard for the, they had to, what they had to do was take a pic, had to copy the black and white print from the book and scanning it, which of course reduces the quality a bit more and then try and make it digital, which is really tough to do. And so that's why they have the problem they do. So, so, so what I wanted to do, what I would have loved to have done and maybe to do is to say, we know the techniques, we see them, but now I will learn by doing them. My students will learn by doing them. We will film them again from different angles, this way, that way, you know, front, side, and we'll do the techniques and we'll get great quality and preserve understanding the techniques. That was what I wanted, right. preserve understanding the techniques. Well, that's, that's ultimately what I tried to do with the videos. Um, and I wish I could have saved the outtakes, but they wouldn't let me save them. They were great. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, the, uh, uh, there have been some videos I've seen uh, several years ago. Someone was actually doing techniques on a clear floor. So you, and this, this is particularly important when you're doing groundwork. So you could see what was happening from the underside. I said, this is- I can't imagine that. What? The clear floor and from the underneath. Yeah. yeah, one of the cameras was underneath. Aye, aye, aye. And I said, wow, there's a perspective no one has seen before. Um, but yeah, it is. It is. Um, when I shot the Panther videos, we had we had two camera crews, and uh, once once they got the hang of it, we moved really fast. We were supposed to. Uh, uh, what's his name? Can't think of the guy who owned Panther. Um, Jennings. Um, he figured we'd take three days to shoot the videos. And I told him beforehand, it'll take two, but he hired the crews for three days. Uh, and so the self-defense techniques, video number eight, uh, was uh, completely ad lib. He, he found us a really sleazy bar in uh, yeah. whatever, whatever, I forget the name of the town even. It's on the way to San Diego. Um, um, where Nixon used to live, um, President Nixon used to live. Oh yeah, I, I know the name. I can't, I can't think of it. But, but anyway, hey. uh, and uh, that's where we shot that day. And he say, "What would you do for?" Answer: so Okay, then we'll do this. You know, and uh, the uh, we did break one pool cue. We in the bar. Uh, and the only quote unquote injury from that was uh, when I put uh, Kevin down on the uh, pool table. Unfortunately, there was a ball on the table and it, he landed right on that on his back, uh. which, you know, it gave him, unfortunately, all it did was give him a good bruise. But um, yeah, that was, a, that was a unique video. What you say you, do, shot the, you shot the first seven videos in three days? Yes. Wow. That's impressive. Well, the, the, the thing is, yeah, I, both Kevin and Ken, and Ken has gone off on his own, both Kevin and Ken, they had been with me for years. They knew the techniques. We knew oh. what we were going to do coming into this. And, and they had, I had used them for previous stuff for black belt. So it wasn't like... Uh, it wasn't, you know, it was kind of like we knew what we were doing and uh, it was just a matter of doing it. Um, so the, the, only, the only thing that slowed us down initially was the camera crew at the beginning. Because so part of what I care about is showing the kids 
I say the kids, you know, 16, 17, 12, however old they are, how exciting and wonderful this is. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I, when I was a classroom teacher, my quote unquote, children were always my kids. And I had administrators who'd get upset with me for calling them kids. And I said, I'm not gonna call a high school kid a child. <laughs> insulting, it's demeaning to them. Uh, which takes us back to uh, when confronting another person verbally. Um, I tend to address people, you know, even, even my students, if it was male, I'd say, sir, or you know, if I didn't know their name offhand, which I'm really bad on names. And if, if you come up to a person and say, sir, that tends to cause them to step back for a minute. And on the street, if I do that, someone will say, are you ex-military? <laughs> yeah. I'll, and I'll say no. And then sometimes they'll ask, well, where did you get that from? I said, well, my parents and training police and military personnel. And then they really stay. <laughs> uh, I have so many stories. I'm not going to waste time. Yeah. But I'll tell you, this guy drive, drove down at 30 miles an hour on our road. And I just stood in the middle of the road and flagged him down. And he said, who do you think you are, the police? I said, no. I, this is my driveway. <laughs> then he called me, sir. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just, you know, you, you can get a reaction out of people. Or I said, you can get the reaction you want out of people without being demeaning to them. But they realize you've made your point. And, uh, bingo. Yeah. And, and I, I would do this. I would do this if I saw students, two students at my school that were going to get into a fight. If there was a situation in the classroom, I had a, I had a, you know, some administrators would, I'd have one administrator who, well, he eventually got transferred because of me. Um, but he said, how can you let this stuff play out so long? And I said, because I want, I prefer that they solve the problem on their own. And if they can do it, why should I? And it increases their self-respect for each other and themselves. So, and then he did a big no-no with, with some of my jiu-jitsu students and that ultimately got him transferred to another school. Um, anyhow, so, um, if anyone wants a copy of the release we use in our dojo, um, and right now one part of it has not been approved by the city because uh, uh, you wanted one, Lonnie? Okay, anybody? Yes. I'd like one too, sir. Uh, Darren, and anyone else? TJ. TJ. Okay. Um, there are two things that were added on for the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, they've both been insured, okayed by our insurance company. Whether the city will go for them is another matter. Uh, the other issue is, at this point is that my surgery, I was scheduled to have a shoulder replacement at the end of this month. Um, and that had been postponed. It was originally supposed to be done in August of last year. And this last week I got notification that it's been postponed again and they won't give me a date. I assume it's another two, three months, but that may delay the opening, reopening of the dojo. Uh, I've been hoping to open it in the summer and this probably knocks it back to the fall. Um, and uh, so I'm not sure what's happening there, but uh, in any case, in the interim, our meetings will continue on the first and third Saturday of the month. Yep.
have